we are gathered together here for the inaugural address at Palis, um, where we're all studying. We're studying uh, the uh, different cultures of the ancient world, the Hebraic Jewish culture, the Hellenic Christian culture, and the Arabic Muslim cultures and languages. And all of these are being studied within uh, the walls of this, uh, of this institution. So it's only proper at this time that I thank my friend and teacher, Professor Christoph Rico, who we call Christophoros, right, in class, the founder and the moving force at Paulus. Uh, I thank him for asking me to open the academic year and share my thoughts about the history and linguistic forms of the name Jerusalem. We will consider how the toponym Jerusalem, a name that recalls religious background, is recorded and, re and recorded and recalled over the past 4,000 years, especially in the monotheistic cultures. Jerusalem has many names. The oldest known and most common name of the city is Jerusalem, or as it was pronounced in Hebrew, Yushalem. It goes back, uh, it's documented already in the 19th and 18th centuries BCE. Where? In Egyptian, where it is found in what's called the execration texts. Let me explain something about these texts. They are either in the form of a bound slave, as you see here, or a captive, or uh, written on shirts uh, in hieroglyphics. Uh, and they list the names mostly of cities found in Canaan, who were under the rule of the Egyptians of the 12th dynasty. Uh, they recorded the names of the towns and sometimes even the rulers of these towns and put them on these, uh, uh, these uh, surfaces so that uh, warning the uh, vassal states that if they would revolt, they would be cursed. So this is a list, it could be a list of curses. Now what we have here in both of these documents from the 19th to the 18th, 17th centuries BCE is the name Yerushalayim, or it's been recognized as Yerushalayim, which we find here at the top. Let me get my other, uh, okay. Right over there, Yerushalayim in uh, Egyptian uh, transliteration. Uh, what we're looking at is something like Yerushalayim with an additional mem at the end and mem sound uh, for whatever reason. So uh, that is the earliest um, documentation of the city name. Um, the next documentation comes in the Elamana period, which is um, as I, uh, over here uh, during the 14th century. The Elamana period is related to Akhenaten, the great religious reformer. I use great, but it, some people say not, but the, he was certainly a, an innovative religious reformer uh, who uh, broke down the priestly orders of Amon, worshiping Amon, and to take on the worship of Aten, the sun god. And so during this period, which was a politically weak uh, period, for various reasons, partly because of the personality of the king and possibly because of the agitation between him and, and the and officialdom and the priesthood uh, of ancient Egypt. In any case, uh, we have this amazing correspondence of some 360 documents that were found in El Amana, which is his capital uh, in Egypt. Uh, and um, among these documents, we find two groups. Half of those documents were written to and from Canaanite vassal states. And half of them were written to and from the major powers of that time, Assyria, Hittites, Alashia, which is Cyprus. And that correspondence has been preserved here, giving us a window into Canaan during this period that precedes the Israelite entry into the country. In other words, this would be not the Hyksos period, but after the Hyksos period and preceding the Israelite period. And so it gives us an idea of what is going on with the little states, the little city-states that are in Canaan. 
And what is especially important for us for this time, this lecture, is that there are five or six of these documents written on clay in cuneiform in Middle Babylonian language, and they preserve the name of the city Uru Salem. The ruler of the city is a man called Abdi Heba. He's the ruler of Jerusalem, or uh, Uru Salim. Now, Abdi Heba uh, is interesting because the name Heba is the consort of the major Hittite god, Tushrata. So what we're looking at as a result of the name is the Hittite uh, influence or the Neo-Hittite influence in Jerusalem. And the Jebusites are probably the same non-Semitic element that came in from Turkey, came in from North Syria, and settled in this area. So that's what we see from this site, from this uh, source. If we look on the next source that we have, pushes us ahead to the period of Sennacherib. Sennacherib was the great conqueror of the Assyrian uh, Empire. He was, he was preceded by his father, Sargon II, who was preceded by, who took over, who usurped the preceding dynasty that was founded by Tiglath-Pileser III and, uh, and uh, created the Assyrian Empire not the Syrian kingdom, but the Assyrian empire that passed through, passed over the Euphrates and conquered Syria and the land of Israel, Transjordan, and then even further went down into Egypt. Uh, be that as it may, in 701, Sennacherib had his third campaign against the West, and he uh, conquered most of Judea. Um, and his great pride was that he conquered the second city, in Judea, which was Lachish. So if you have a chance now, during the year, make a field trip and go to Lachish, you can see the site itself, which is very impressive. Now, what um, Sennacherib had done was, uh, so proud of that, is that he made a wall uh, tablet uh, around his uh, royal chamber, in which he depicted himself sitting on a throne and the capture of Lachish. So I'm sure that on your trips, I, um, even to the museum, you'll be able to see a copy of that in the Israel Museum. And of course, the original is in the British Museum, thank God, and not in, <laughs> not in uh, Nimrud, which is Mosul uh, today, which has been destroyed. Be that as it may, this is a depiction of Sennacherib. This is the only one that we have. Now, Sennacherib, we know from the Bible, we know from the Akkadian sources, that he was uh, killed by his sons. And what happened was that one of the sons was probably so angry that he went into the royal chamber after they killed the king and he smashed the face of Sennacherib, which you can see over here, out of anger. So you have to be careful with your children. <laughs> so now look, we've looked at this and we see that, um, that, um, that, um, these, these sources tell us about the earliest examples of the pronunciation, about the name of Jerusalem. What is the earliest biblical reference to Jerusalem? And here we look at, at, um, at um, the book of Genesis. And there we find the story of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek uh, is, de is depicted as the king of Salem, the king of Shalem. And everybody assumes that that is the basis of the name Yerushalayim. That's the second half, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, that is the second half. And so Melchizedek goes out to greet Abraham after his military victory. And Melchizedek, the king of, Sh uh, of Shalem, brought forth bread. I have it here. Okay, there it is. Malkitzedek, Melech Shalem. I'm reading the Hebrew, but you have the English here as well. Hotzi lechem v'yayin, v'hu kohen le'el elyon. He is the priest, the Most High. That's how you would read the text simply. And so, v'yivarchehu, and he blessed him, v'yomar baruch Abraham le'el elyon, konei shamayim v'aretz. And here you have an epithet. 
Who is El Elyon? He is the creator, Kone Shemayim Ba'aretz. It's an old term, Kone. Kone, today we say to buy, to purchase. But the original meaning is to, to create, to make, to fashion. And so we find that El Elyon is the creator of the universe. <coughs> he is El Elyon Kone Shemayim Ba'aretz. And we know from Ugarit, we know from Canaanite myth, mythology, that El Elyon was the high god. He was the father figure, the high god. And so this is what we see in the text. Um, so what we're looking at is that Salem uh, has been um, uh, accepted as the old name, the old form of Yerushalem. And so we find in Psalms 76, 2 and 3, we find a reference to that. No Dabi Yehuda Elohim. God was known in, has made himself known in Judah. Be Yisrael Gadol Shemo. His name is great in Israel. By he be Shalem Sukkot. And his abode, his Sukkah, we just had Haga Sukkot now. His abode, Sukkah, be Shalem, is in Shalem. And in parallel to that, we find the normal parallel, Yushalayim and Sion, right? So we find here that Psalms, which is written a long time afterwards, recalls, echoes that relationship of Shalem, Yerushalayim, and so on. And then we'll see this further along as well. Now, uh, when we look at the name Yerushalayim from a linguistic point of view, what do we see? We see the two elements. We see Yeru. And we see Shalem. Well, maybe let's just go back. Let me move back. Go back with this. Is my other thing. This is that. Okay. So we see here Shalem is one part. And if we look at the name itself, it's Yerushalayim. So that, as I said before, these old names from the second millennium have two parts. They're sentence names. They have a subject and a predicate. So what would be the subject in Yerushalayim? Shalem would be a subject. And who is Shalem? Shalem is a divinity, is an old Canaanite divinity, it's known to us now from Ugarit. Now, he must have been associated with the site of Yerushalayim. And then we ask ourselves, what is the other element here? The other element must be a verb. So we have Yeru. So Shalem did something. Now, what is Yeru? Now, I can only go, if I don't have any Ugaritic texts here, uh, Northwest Semitic text, and I must go to Hebrew. So we find in Hebrew the use of yeriah, yara. Yara means to throw. Now, generally in our language, but it also means to set, to set the stone, to throw the stone, to set the stone. And so we have that in a repeated in Jacob's uh, meeting with, with, with Laban, that Jacob and Laban set the stone that will concretize their relationship, their covenant between them. So that's the term that seemingly is found here, which leads me to think what kind of stone would be worthy of a creator God, of a divinity. And the only thing I can think of is the foundation stone of the world. Now, since El Elyon, Konei Shemayim Ba'aretz, who created the world, where did he create it? In mythic terms, the umphalis of the world, the navel of the world, is at Jerusalem. And this is a tradition that we have not in the Bible. It's extra-biblical. But we do have this ongoing tradition, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, that the stone Evan Hashtiyah, which means just that, the set stone, the foundation stone, and Asahara in Arabic, which is the rock, so we have the dome of the rock, is the place for the foundation. And that, of course, in Jewish tradition, is at the base of the Holy of Holies in the first and second temple. So that I, I'm not going too far astray if I say, that Yerushalayim, the foundation stone, is connected to the name of the city itself, and that is uh, kept by tradition, that's found in tradition. So that's an ongoing tradition, not biblical, but I find it in the biblical name. Okay, now, where is Yerushalayim mentioned, or Jerusalem mentioned, in extra-biblical sources, 
that are Israelite. There are two documents that I know of. One has been recently found. It was published last year. It's a papyrus. This papyrus was found uh, uh, among uh, cave robbers in the Judean desert. It says memtet, memtaf. It's the first word. The first word is broken. So what we see over here is that the original there was a, a, an initial line up here. You can see the edge of this, a few letters. You see it was broken over here. And then this would be the second line, and this would be the third line. So what we read here is, look here, you see the word Hamelech, the king. Minna'arta, minna'arta, from a place called Na'arta, or Na'aram, or Na'arin, which is five kilometers from, from Jericho. Nivalayim uh, seems to be a dual form, Nivalayim, two uh, uh, wine containers. Nivalayim Yayim, Yerushalayma, Yerushalemma, Yerushalemma. To be sent to Jerusalem, Yerushalemma, with the, uh, with the ending of direction, right, Yerushalemma. Of course, this document never got to Yerushalemma. It was lost, or stolen, or maybe they, they, they were uh, apprehended somewhere along the line. And so this document wound up in a cave in the Judean desert and was discovered probably by the cave robbers who were then caught by the police, and then this document became available to us. Now what we find here is interesting. You know, uh, if you have the form here, Yerushalema, you're looking at something that, that has no Yud here, which is the biblical form. In other words, if I would be a, uh, a forger today, uh, I might fall into the trap to write Yerushalema, right, with the Yud there. So that's a giveaway. Okay, this is the first text that we have. The second text was one that was found in the 1970s, not far from Lakish. It is a graffito that's written on the soft limestone of the caves in the Shvela, in Lachish, near Lachish. And this uh, scratching, which you can see today, both of the documents you can see today in the Israel Museum. And so this document uh, reads like this, at least according to the way I would read it. Yud Hei Vav Hei, the divine name of God. Uh, Elohe Kol Haaretz, Harei Yehuda Lo, Lelohe Yerushalayim. So what we're looking at as a as an epigraphist, the first thing I look at is the surface, is the writing surface. The writing surface happens to be in a cave. The handwriting here is not professional. It's a, really a graffito. It's not a monumental document. And so it was probably written by people trying to escape one of the outside campaigns that were going either by the Assyrians that we mentioned before, Sennacherib in 701, or by the Book of Netzer in 5. 96 or 586, uh, and they fled to the cave as a refuge. And there they raise up their prayer. Because this is a prayer. They raise up their prayer. Hashem, Elohei kol ha'aretz, harei Yehuda lo, lelohei Yerushalayim. And if we look at it from a literary point of view, here again you have to look at these things not only the surface, not only the epigraphy, not only the language, but what is the, what is the topos, what is the type of, of a document that we have here? And it's a prayer, and it's a literary prayer. So you can see here a heightening of the geography, the God of all the earth. And then he's the, the mountains of Judah are his. And then finally, belonging to the God of Jerusalem. So we see here, the earth, Judah, and then the pinnacle is Jerusalem. So this is a, a prayer that's coming out of the mouth of somebody in the biblical period that's uh, praying to God while he seeks refuge, trying to get away from the enemies. So these are the two documents, 
specific documents that mention the name of Jerusalem uh, from the uh, period of the Iron Age, if you want to talk in archaeological terms, uh, or the period of the monarchy. Now, uh, when we look at uh, this material, uh, we see um, that Jerusalem is mentioned some 665 times in the Bible. The name Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim. Within this corpus, we find two features regarding the name that will shape how future generations look and speak about Jerusalem. The first feature is the attribute of holiness. That somewhere in the period of the prophets, we have an attached attribute of Jerusalem, the holy. And that begins to take form at this time. And the second uh, item that, that interests us is how the name is pronounced by Jews. We find in the later poetic books of the second Isaiah, prophet Joel, Psalms, and in the narrative of Nehemiah, the attribute holy applied to Jerusalem. So let's look at that here. In Isaiah 48, Shimuzo, Beit Yaakov, and Ikarim, and so on, for they are called from the holy city, the last line, Bet, second line, for they are called from the holy city. This seems to be the first biblical reference to Jerusalem as the holy city. This is Isaiah 48. Those of you who are biblical scholars would say 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah would place him roughly uh, in the Babylonian exile, about uh, 560 uh, BCE. And so, and upon the God of Israel, they trust whose name, okay, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Now, if we look at Isaiah 52, again we see the uh, prophet say, Uri, Uri, Lifshi, Uzeich, Zion, Lifshi, Bigdei, Tevateich, Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh. Now, we're looking at parallelism, biblical parallelism, which uses the term Zion and Yerushalayim, these two parts. Now, some people would like to differentiate between that and say Zion perhaps is more a reference to the Holy Mountain and Yerushalayim to the city, but it's hard to tell in these texts because of the, of the, uh, the parallelism. So if we see here, Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself in splendor, put on your robes of majesty. Jerusalem, holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall never enter you again. And then we go ahead on. And we look at the next one, that's Psalms 20. Now Psalms makes a certain innovation. He reads, Yishlach Ezracha Mikodesh Umitzion Isa'adeka. So you have here the, uh, a really a synonymous parallelism. So God will send Ezracha, your help, will send your help from Kodesh. Now what he's done here is taken now, Yerushalayim HaKodesh, or Kadosh, Ir HaKodesh, and he's just said, alone we could say Kodesh, and that is enough to describe Jerusalem. And from Zion sustain you. So you all, you know the, the Hebrew, Yishlach Ezracham Kodesh, Zion Yisa'adeka, Sa'adeka, Yisa'aduni, in Arabic, and so we have this beautiful parallelism, and the innovation of the psalmist here that the city is Kodesh par excellence, holiness par excellence. We go on and we look at Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is dated clearly. We're looking at 445 BCE, the time of the return, second temple, the beginning of the first generation, second generation of the first temple, of the second temple. And so uh, in the narrative now has taken up what is in the poetic. What has happened there? Uh, Nehemiah, the newly appointed governor, Persian governor of Jerusalem, has concern about the restoration of the city. First of all, creating the walls, completing the walls, restoring the walls around the city, and then also populating the city, which is empty. And so he makes a census of the population, it comes up with about 45,000, 50,000 Jewish people living in Judah, Judea. And he says, now one out of every 10 has to move 
to Jerusalem to populate the city. And so we get an idea of the demography, of the population of the city at that time. And Nehemiah looks at and says, and he calls Jerusalem, uh, he calls Jerusalem, Yushalayim Ir HaKodesh. So in other words, it's become a term now, not only a poetic term, but it's become part of the parlance of the period. And so we look at Joel, and uh, we see something different. Uh, the question that is raised, or that I would like to raise, even though we're talking about linguistics, is a theological problem, or a theological uh, issue. Uh, when we say holy city, what do we mean? When we say holy land, what do we mean really? And so uh, the question can be answered in many ways. What do we attribute to the land of Israel? What do we attribute to the city of Jerusalem that makes it holy? Because man wants to find the holy. He is looking for the holy. Where may the holy be? And so we see here, is it the temple that's built that, that makes it a holy city? Or um, is it uh, more primordial? Is it a sacred mountain? Or is it a sacred stone? That's the infamous of the world. Perhaps it is a miracle that occurred in that site, in that city, or a saint who walked in that area whose footsteps we try to vicariously live, relive the holiness, the miracle that happened at that site. It seems to me that there is another reason for the holiness of Jerusalem that is expressed by the prophet Joel. In chapter 4, verse 17, he says, V'yedatem, v'yedatem, ki ani Hashem Elohechem, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Shochein b'tzion har kodshi. Shochein b'tzion har kodshi. In other words, dwell, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain har kodshi. V'yeta Yerushalayim kodesh v'zarim lo yavru ba'od. In other words, according to Joel, what makes the site holy? And according to what I would say, is because God dwells in that city. Shochein. The word shochein, I'm sure all of you know the roots, indicating it's shaking, to replace, to come in place. In Greek, it's skeno. Uh, skeno, right? right? A tent, and, or a scene in Latin. Um, and in the Arabic, Sakim, no. Sakim, Anasakim Kutz, right? I live, the same root. It's all the Semitic root that goes to the Greek, it goes to, even to Latin. And so this is the term here. And in Hebrew, in rabbinic Hebrew, this it takes on a noun form. That noun form is Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is the presence, is the presence of God at this site. It's what's called the indwelling, or the numinous divine presence, according to Rudolf Otto. So this is what is manifest in Jerusalem. And so from the Shekhinah emanates all the other aspects of holiness, the city, according to the prophet and according to Jewish tradition. The second feature that appears in the biblical text is the linguistic feature. All of the 665 citations of Jerusalem in the Masoretic text are pronounced in Hebrew Yerushalayim. You've learned Hebrew here? You're living in Yerushalayim? When you say it that way? When you say it in English? Jerusalem, right? So what we find is sort of an anomaly here that the text 660 times, there are five cases in the Masoretic text where Yushalayim is written, written uh, uh, as here. In other words, what we're looking at, we're looking at here is 660 times in the Bible, the text is written Yerushalayim without vowels, but it is pronounced Yerushalayim by Jews and in Jewish dialects. That's a very interesting point here. 
Now, what we're looking at here in this first case is called Ktiv Vekre. Ktiv Vekre is the principle of seeing the written text and reading something else with a change, with a difference. So Ktiv is from the word Ketav, this is Aramaic. It's written, Ktiv, and Kre is how it's pronounced. The Kro, how you read it. So that we have here, this is going on in the biblical text. So when Jews read the Bible and they look and find 660 times Yerushalayim, they read it Yerushalayim, <coughs> like this, as if it was written like this. And so five times in the Bible, in the Masoretic text, it is written like this, so that we see that that tradition is very old. Now, when we look at the New Testament, uh, we find also a, um, a two different forms. We find Jerusalem, as here, that's found all the time in the Septuagint of the Hebrew Bible. And then we find in the later uh, New Testament and uh, Apocrypha, uh, we find uh, Hierusoluma, uh, the uh, second form with a rough breathing over here. So we'll look into that and see what, where, where, we go with, where we go there. The idea of two forms uh, was current throughout the Second Temple period. So that we find in uh, Qumran, the Qumran documents, we find both the uh, plenty form, Yerushalayim, and the defective form, Yerushalayim. And this uh, continues down straight through into the Roman period. But let's take a look at the coinage that was minted during the Great Revolt. Now, you know, 66 to 70 was the Great Revolt of the Jews against Rome. And one of the aspects of declaring that, that independence was to establish a mint uh, on the Temple Mount. And so what we find here is the, uh, the, uh, the mint which celebrates Jerusalem. Uh, and what we're looking at is uh, the coin from the first year, from the first year, 66. And here we find the name Yerushalayim, written Yud, Reish, Vav, Shin, Lamed, Men. Defective. Defective. And then the next word, Hey, Hey, uh, I'm sorry, no Hey, Kuf, Dalit, Shin, He. Now, if you're having trouble reading that, that's because it's Paleo Hebrew. In other words, one aspect of declaring independence was not using the square script that was in use among other nations around the area from Aramaic, from uh, development of Aramaic. And so this is a return to the ancient Hebrew script. So it also has a message to it. And then, the other part, of course, also says Shekel, Shekel Yisrael. Shekel Yisrael begins with the right side, goes around to the left, and then has the chalice uh, and the uh, rimonim, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, pomegranates, the pomegranates, uh, symbol, uh, ancient symbol here, that has to do also with the priestly garments and other aspects of temple worship. So what we're looking at here uh, is a statement of, uh, of uh, independence. Now, this statement changes during the next four years. So the coinage that is uh, minted in Jerusalem now bears the following um, uh, script. Yud, Reish, Vav, Shin, Lamed, Yud, Men. And then, to complete it further, Hakidosha. In other words, not Yerushalayim Kedosha, but now Yerushalayim Hakidosha. And this becomes the standard. This is what you read here. This becomes the standard until the war, the, the, the rebellion, the, the revolt is put down in 70 of the Common Era. Now, if you note here also, we can tell there's a shin and there's a bet here, which means shana bet, second year, second year. So each one of these coins, silver or bronze coins, has these notations on it so we can read uh, the, uh, and, and place it by time. Now, um, so
So what we're looking at now is both of these readings of Yerushalayim, and I emphasize again that the form Yerushalayim continues among Jewish, in Hebrew, and among all other Jewish dialects, perhaps not Ethiopic in Jewish, but, but uh, because they're taking their text from Gez, uh, from uh, Christian text, but all of the Jewish uh, uh, dialects read Yerushalayim. Now the peculiar form of Yerushalayim that appears to be a dual, right? If you read Yerushalayim, you're going to say, what, what does that mean? If I want to analyze it uh, linguistically, it has a dual ending. So um, uh, there's been a great deal of discussion since the 19th century about the meaning of that ending of the name. And these fall along three lines, either semantic, morphological, or phonetic. So for those who think that Yerushalayim is really a dual, they look for some sort of historic uh, context. So it may be that Nehemiah, when he restored the city, he tells us that he appointed two governors, one for the upper city, one for the lower city. And so there are two. So this quasi-dual became current, according to some scholars, from that time. Of course, later in the Talmud, as well as in the New Testament, we have another idea that comes in, that there are two Jerusalems. There's a heavenly Jerusalem, and there's an earth of Jerusalem. So that that idea also probably emanates from this form, this dual form that suggests the, uh, the dual uh, part of the city. Of course, I don't accept it, but that's, uh, that's part of tradition that we learn. Now, uh, the second opinion is that, no, we're looking here at a morphological uh, uh, form. Uh, we're looking at uh, something that has to do with a locative ending. We're looking at something that tells us about place names. And so this idea was suggested by Jacob Barth, a great scholar, linguistic scholar of the 19th century, early 20th century, and he uh, has made this opinion, and this has been uh, accepted by most, uh, most serious scholars today. Uh, I may quote one scholar who says, the affirmative ayin, ayin, is nothing more than a West Semitic morphological feature, which in its own way attempts to delineate the distinctive geographical feature of this site. And so he finds that in places like Mitzrayim, Karnaim, Machanaim, and so forms like that, and so concludes that Yerushalayim is a back formation. So that in the course of speaking the language, you associate, you attribute to the name Yerushalayim that it has also the, this ending. Of course, it doesn't seem true to me because the mem in Yerushalayim is not an ending, it's not a suffix, but it's part of the root. My own opinion, which I've written about, and will not go into detail, is the phonetic. In other words, that what we're looking at here is a, 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 a cluster uh, at the end of an accented syllable. It's Yerushalem, and so the accented syllable is a long vowel between a lamed and a mem, the sonorous, sonorous uh, 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 consonants. And so I think what's happening here is a secondary uh, diphthong has been created, and that has been accepted by Jews and all Jewish dialects. So this has become, I would say, a linguistic, uh, linguistic marker for the Jewish people. Uh, the, who have kept this form in spite of the fact that everybody knows that the element is shalem and not shalayim and so on. Be that as it may, I, you can see here differences of opinion, of scholarly opinion, and I'm just trying to summarize it here. Now if we look further and go into um, uh, okay, uh, just one other point on the coinage here. It's been suggested that the Jerusalem the Holy, noting uh, the defective and plain spelling of the silver Jewish revolt coins, the shekel, the half shekel, quarter shekel, uh, and also the bronze puta, uh, is, uh, appears to be from the onset of the revolt in order to create affinity between the holiness of Jerusalem and its temple with the revolt which broke out in Jerusalem. In other words, we have to look at context. What is this saying here to the people at that time? In other words, there's a revolt going on, and there has to be a rallying call 
for the, as we know, for the Maccabean period, is a rallying call for it. What, do you, what, what can you identify with? So what uh, many scholars say is that the, the, the intentional placing of Yerushalayim Kedoshah, Yerushalayim HaKedoshah, is the rallying call for the people who handle the coinage every day, and they could identify with the revolt that's going on. Now, in support of that is the fact that there are some um, not so good coins that were found in Gamla, in the, in the, in the Golan Heights. Now, Gamla took part in the revolt. And what we see there, that in Gamla, the local mint was beginning to produce its own coins, Yerushalayim HaKedosha. So in other words, they were identified with the revolt, with the ideals of the revolt against the Roman Empire. Now, when we turn to the Greek transcriptions of Jerusalem, Josephus, uh, in, in describing the history of Jerusalem, the history of Jewish history, in his wars, in the war, he, uh, in book six, the last chapter, he refers to the city of Jerusalem. And he gives us this bit of information. But he who first built it, now who built Jerusalem? From, we're looking at a man, Josephus, at the, at the first, first century of the Common Era was a potent man, was a strong man among the Canaanites. He was a Canaanite. And in our own tongue, we call him Melchizedek, the righteous king. For such he really was. On which account he was there, the first priest of God, and first built a temple, Hiron, a temple there, and called the city Jerusalem, which was formerly called Salem. Now you have to see what does the Greek say about Jerusalem. The Greek says about Jerusalem, we have Hirosoluma. So in other words, we're looking at the form of Hiros, the Greek form of holy Saluma. So what Josephus is saying, his etymology, and it's interesting, he's going back to Malkitzedek, as we started with the biblical text. He's going back to that and say, people, you read the Bible, Jerusalem, but know that it was, there's another form, Jerusalem, and that form was created by Melchizedek. Why? Because he built the Hiron, right? The first Hiron in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the, in Jerusalem. And so, Salima now is a holy Salem, according to Josephus' etymology, holy Salem. And so that introduces us now to the Greek material. And this, uh, Rico will take up at a, after this uh, talk. Uh, I just wanted to mention a few things here, if I may, that um, the differentiation is that in, uh, that in the Septuagint, we find the defective form. And in later words, we find the, uh, the, uh, the elongated form. Now, scholars who have dealt with this problem, or this problem, this uh, dichotomy here, um, have explained it in various ways. Uh, some scholars say that what we're looking at is a Hebrew and a Hellenistic form. The, and so, looking particularly at Luke and Acts, where this dichotomy keeps appearing and interchange, to find some sort of meaning to these two terms. So according to many scholars, the Jerusalem is Jewish Jerusalem. It's the holy Jerusalem, the sanctity of Jerusalem. And Hieros Salima is the geographic form. And so to find some sort of difference in interpretation. Now this opinion has not been accepted by everybody. And so there's a scholar by the name of Silva who uh, concentrates on the Lucan source, concludes none of these theories on the use of different Jerusalem terms in different types of material or sources of source criticism have adequately explained the evidence of these terms. Silva goes on to suggest a literary ploy where Luke is juxtaposing both names in order to consciously emphasize the etymology of the biblical name in the Septuagint as derived from heroes holy. While I have no easy solution to this conundrum, I do know that the early church and the New Testament authors were part of a Jewish society where there was an ongoing tradition of writing the name Yerushalayim in Hebrew, as found in the biblical text as Yerushalayim. In other words, there was a dual Ketiv Kray tradition, Jewish tradition, 
And uh, as we have seen above, in discussing the coinage uh, uh, minted in the Great Revolt, both forms were interchanged in writing. Perhaps here too, in the New Testament, authors were applying the pra this practice to their own writings in Greek by simultaneously writing the biblical form of the Septuagint and then the supposed Hellenistic form that we see that Josephus attributes to Malkitzedek. From the 6th century of the Common Era, from the Byzantine period, we have the extraordinary uh, made of a map that you should all know, which is based on Eusebius's onomasticon that was written around 300 of the Common Era. A contemporary Byzantine Jerusalem is portrayed in the center of the Medeba map of the Holy Land. In other words, the Medeba map captures what is the Holy Land in visual form. We can't go into that here, it's worth another lecture in its own right, but in the center of that is the oldest map of Jerusalem. Starting over here, looked at from towards the east, uh, this is the west, this is the south, this is the Nea, this is the north, and you can see the pillar in the Damascus Gate, where probably Hadrian had set up his statue, and then became St. Stephen's Gate, and then again in the Arabic sources later uh, is retained in Bab Alamud. Bad al, Bad al in other words, at the time of the uh, Muslim conquest in the seventh century, they still saw the pillar here. Perhaps they removed the statue, perhaps it was already removed, but that is the distinguishing mark, and this we see in the Maid of the Map. We can go into more of this, but what's of interest for us here is the caption on top. Caption on top reads, He Hagia Polis Jerusalem. What we see here, the holy city of Jerusalem, which really depicts the victory of Christianity over Judaism and implying what is holy about the city, the churches that abound throughout the city and no Jewish remnant exists, not on the Temple Mount nor in any other place here. So this is an expression of victory. It's an expression of what is holiness that is placed in, in this city. So we see it here in the mosaic. This is a mosaic of some million uh, cubes uh, in eight different colors. It's found in Medaba, and if, I imagine you've visited the church, St. George's Church in Medaba and seen it. It was partially, the, the total map was partially destroyed in 1887 by the uh, uh, local Christians who wanted to restore the church and started to break up the floor <laughs> until they were stopped. Of course, they said, well, wait a second, well, what are we doing here? Okay. So, what we're looking at uh, <coughs> is uh, the, in 638, the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem. Now, Muslims take on the names of what they hear, what the local population is pronouncing and saying. And so, the uh, name that they first attribute, the Muslims first attribute to Jerusalem is Ilya, which is adopted from the Roman Byzantine name Ilya Capitolina. Ilya Capitolina was founded by Hadrian, whose full name was Alias Hadrianus. And so he uh, founded the, he refounded the city, destroying all Jewish remnants in the city, wiping out the name, and then making the city a site, a center for pagan worship of Jupiter. And this was done after the Bar Kokhba revolt of 135 of the Common Era. Now, ironically, Jerusalem is now called by the Muslims, Ilya Medinat Bait al-Makdis, which means Ilya, the city of the Beit HaMikdash, of the temple, of the temple. So in other words, what we find here is uh, the early Muslims attempt to deal with a local name and give it meaning, new meaning. So Ilya, they had no idea that that came from Adrianus, that was Latin. And so they give it a folk etymology. Ilya, perhaps from Elijah. And so, while in Arabic, Elijah is Elias, uh, he named Hebrew, Elia. 
Or perhaps we have to give it another Arabic uh, etymology, Ahal, a place. Ahal Ya, in other words, a composite of Arabic, Ahal, Oha, uh, Ahal Musala, a home, Ya, a remnant, an echo of Ya, of the God of Israel, perhaps. So I say it's ironic because the, this name continues on in Arabic circles as Beit al-Maktis, Beit al-Maktis, a term for Jerusalem that has been taken up by even some uh, um, terrorist groups as well, Beit al-Maktis. So I think that, that is ironic in its own way. Um, ultimately, uh, the name changed in the medieval period to Al-Quds. And so Al-Quds seems to be derived from Beit Al-Maktis, Kodesh. At the same time, in the early medieval period, we find Jewish attempts to rename Jerusalem in Arabic. Now, one of the great lights of the Jewish uh, tradition is Rabbi Sa'adia ben Yosef al-Fayumi. Fayumi, Fayumi is in Egypt. Al-Fayumi was Egyptian, and he was appointed the head of the rabbinic world that sits in Iraq, in uh, close to uh, Baghdad. And he uh, was at home in Arabic, as most intellectual Jews were at that time, Arabic philosophy, particularly Arabic grammar. And so he uh, translated the Hebrew Bible into Arabic. And uh, it's interesting because he takes a certain uh, um, uh, attitude to names. He doesn't tra transliterate the names, but he sort of interprets the names that he comes across. So, so that Yehuda is shukrun, shuka, thank you, from Yodeh, toda. And so he applies the Jewish tradition through the Arabic because he's writing also for Jews who speak Arabic, and he's writing for non-Jews, for Muslims or Christians who want to know the Bible in, in Arabic. So it's interesting to see that in Genesis 14, 18, where we have the name Salem, he calls it Dar as Salam, Dar as Salam, Beit of Salam. And then again, in Psalms that we've read before, he calls it Medinat as Salam. Now, what is he doing? You have to hear this. Because obviously, referring to see the second element, salam, in the name derived from the Hebrew word shalom, or Arabic salam, as not from Islam. Because we know Dar al-Islam, as opposed to Dar al-Harb, is a Muslim uh, term for dividing up the world between those who have accepted, who have, who have given in to Islam, basic meaning, as opposed to those who have to be converted. So what, uh, what uh, Sadia is doing is taking the Arabic, making the Arabic, but giving it a Jewish content. According to the famous Muslim geographer, Al-Muqadasi, sometimes called Al-Makdisi, Al-Muqadasi lived 967 to 985. His name itself, Muqadasi, is the Jerusalemite. He comes from Jerusalem. <coughs> and he says, the name Al-Quds came into use during the early medieval period. Now, some scholars looking at why Al-Quds, they say perhaps it is derived ultimately from Aramaic, because the Targum, Targum Jonathan, to Isaiah, reads Karta de Kutsha, Karta de Kutsha, Kutsha being Kodesh, being Al-Quds. So in other words, there is a reflex in the Aramaic. If that's the case, it's interesting, I don't know. The name Al-Quds continues to be used in the Arab world, of course. The state of Israel introduced an Arabic term, Urshalim Al-Quds. It's a conciliatory form. In other words, like most conquerors who just erase the early names and replace it with their own, this is conciliatory because it attempts to retain both the Jewish and the Arab traditions. The name may have been created by Moshe Sharet, who was the second prime minister of Israel and a known Arabist. He died in 1965. So after the unification of the city in June 1967 as Israel's capital, the name became official 
in recognition of the multicultural life in modern Jerusalem. And that's what we see here. We see here Yerushalayim, and then the attempt to transliterate that into Arabic with a what looks even like the Pshita, looks like the Aramaic of the Pshita, Ur Shalim, and then Al Quds, and of course in English for everybody else, Jerusalem. And so we see this multicultural life in even in the street signs of uh, of uh, Mount Jerusalem. In the short talk today, I've tried to bring together the multifaceted sources documented over the past 4,000 years that shed light on the linguistic history of the name of Jerusalem. It is only when one begins to understand the layers of meaning enshrined in its name can we begin to feel the charisma that Jerusalem holds for so many people. While we've been discussing linguistics and rules and forms that you'll all be learning here in your various languages, I would like to refer to another source, Midrash. Midrash is rabbinic writing on Bible and on values. And the Midrash on the sanctity of the Temple Mount helps us to think out of the box. When you look at Midrash, you learn to think out of the box. Because it tells a story, a parable. The story is two brothers who lived on two sides of a mountain not far from here. One was very poor, but he was blessed with a large family. And the other was very rich, but had nobody, was not married. One day, after the harvest, and now we just celebrate Sukkot, which is Chagasif, the harvest of the ingathering of fruits. It was a very successful harvest, a thief. And so the poor brother, his family, sat down with this wonderful harvest of fruits, vegetables, and he said to his wife, how can I eat this alone? My brother lives on the other side of the mountain. He's alone and he's getting older. What's going to be with him? Who's going to take care of him? Somebody has to worry about it, that he has food in his plate. At the same moment, the other brother, the rich brother, says to himself, wait a second, I have so much abundance here. And my brother has a wonderful family, 10 children. How is he managing to feed them? I must bring over some food. But each one realized that the other brother would not accept a gift like that openly. So they decided at night to go to the other brother's house and put the food at the doorway. And so as each brother walked up the hill, and they came up to the top of the hill, they ran into each other. And they realized what they were doing. Now, I quote my teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel. He used to say, and he wrote on this, of course, the main book, God in search of man. Now we said before that all of these terms about holiness is man searching for God, looking for the holiness in a certain sign. Heschel says, no. The real thing is that God is looking for man. And so when God looks down and sees these two brothers getting together and helping each other in this brotherly love and this concern, for each other, what we call in Hebrew, the milut chesed, unrequited help for each other. God said, this is the place that I want to establish my temple, my holy temple, because this site concretizes these virtues, these values. That's the Midrash, so it teaches you to think differently about this whole question about Jerusalem, the holy. And I conclude with the prophecy of Isaiah, <coughs> chapter 56. I will bring them to my sacred mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people.
I agree perfectly with you when you were talking about the two names in Greek, Jerusalemma, uh, with the uh, rough uh, breathing, and Jerusalem, <coughs> this one uh, with uh, the, the other breathing, the, how do you call it? Smooth. Smooth, Smooth breathing, thank you. Uh, that uh, the presentations that we have, uh, the interpretations that we have by uh, uh, Joseph Ruiz Camps and uh, Ignace de la Poterie that would tend to say that Jerusalem would be the place, uh, I mean, like, this name would have, let us say, a religious connotation, and this one, a geographic connotation, doesn't fit really well with all the data. And uh, I agree with you that uh, the, the article of uh, Denis Silva is uh, much more enlightening. He says that if we take at least the uh, Gospel of uh, St. Luke and uh, the Acts, which is seen like um, one book is the continuation of the other, so at the beginning of each one of the books, you have first Jerusalem and then Jerusalem like setting a pattern, setting a... and then um, uh, in the two cases it's a repetition and this is very all the more uh, significant that Yerosolima appears very rarely in these two books and it is like if it were the explanation of Jerusalem, Jerusalem which is the Hieros, the holy Solima so what I'm going to try to do now, very quickly, is to explain how we get to Hierosolum uh, in Greek. First thing I would like to say is that what we have in the Septuagint, the first name that we have is Salem, which is a translation of uh, Shalem. And uh, the, the first reference is Genesis 14, uh, 18, so the, 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 epi the episode with, uh, with uh, Melchizedek. Um, and then, practically, the word Salem uh, appears very rarely in the, in the Septuagint. There are several instances of where we see Salem instead of Shechem, uh, Salem instead of Shiloh. There might have been a problem of uh, uh, transliteration, of a problem of the text that uh, um, the, the forlage from which uh, uh, the translator goes. Yeah. yeah. In the biblical text, it says that Jacob came to Shechem. Yes. Ir Shalem. Mm. Ir Shalem. Ir Shalem. So there's another Salem or Shalem near Shechem. Yes. So that is the uh, the connection. connection. And then, uh, of course, we have uh, in uh, Jeremiah 14.1.5, uh, Salem instead of uh, Shiloh. So there, there might be a, a problem of variant reading. Uh, then you have another quotation in Judith, uh, a deuterocanonical book, and that's it. Um, so the question is, where, where does Solimus come from? Because Solima is not Salem. Uh, where, where does this O come from? Where does this U come from? There is a problem here. So the first thing that we have to know is that uh, the word Solima is already extant in Homer. Um, we have in Homer uh, Ta Soluma uh, in plural. Uh, talking about a mountain, uh, which is the mountain Solima. It's also described by Strabo and other authors in antiquity. Uh, it's a, 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 a mountain that is founded in uh, Lycia, so in Anatolia. And it is called Solima. Um, it's interesting because Flavius Josephus, in one of his texts, he hints to the fact that Homer uh, uh, talked about Jerusalem, uh, which of course it's obviously not right. He's not talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about Solima in Lycia. Um, so um, 
the first, uh, the first, uh, the starting point is Soluma, the mountain in Lycia, um, and uh, this model <coughs> is uh, alluded to in an explicit way by Aelius Herodianus. Uh, he says, Jerusalem, um, the metropolis of Judea, so Jerusalem, the capital of the Judea, e Soluma, or Soluma. E caleito apoton solumon oron was called like that because of the Soluma mountains. So uh, a kind of acknowledgement that the spelling Soluma comes through the influence of another toponym in uh, Anatolia. Um, then um, the thing, uh, uh, the first time that we find Soluma explicitly used for Jerusalem, it's uh, um, with Flavius Josephus. So uh, uh, Flavius Josephus explains first, and that was uh, uh, the text uh, that you were quoting before, that Jerusalem is called Jerusalem because Melchizedek, king of Soluma, was a priest of God. So obviously you have a play of word between To Hieron and Hiero Soluma. So, but still, the question remains, why do we say Soluma instead of saying Jerusalem? We could have said Jerusalem. Why, why come to Soluma? Where, uh, where does this come from? And uh, um, we have also another interesting quote by Flavius Josephus in his uh, uh, Antiquitates in book 7 he says first that David and interesting, interestingly enough he doesn't uh, spell it Dawid as you could find it in the Septuagint Dawid or, uh, uh, or with or without the O uh, so uh, you have, uh, he doesn't say it like that but he uh, quotes Dawid da uh, da da with the fo following um, uh, with the following uh, spelling Dawides. What does it mean? It means that uh, Flavius Josephus has the strong um, um, concern of giving. Jewish names that have a Hellenistic uh, sound, a Hellenistic form. You do not find in Greek any word which is ending with D. This is not a, a normal in Greek. It's always long words where you will find a D at the end of the, of the name. So he's adding a, a, an ending which sounds Greek. And that's the key to understand what has happened. So I quote uh, uh, the text of Flavius Josephus. First, David expelled the Jebusians from Jerusalem, giving his own name to the city, that is, the city of David. Uh, but in the times of Abraham, our ancestor, it was called Soluma. And he says, he gives this, this uh, spelling. And he adds, after that, some people say that Homer called. Um, after that, some people say that Homer called also Jerusalem like that, Soluma. So uh, he is mistakenly thinking that Homer was talking about the city of Jerusalem. Um, for the temple, he called it Solima, that is security, according to the Hebrew language, because of the fact that the, the temple was there. And that uh, uh, comes to confirm uh, uh, the other quote of Flavius Josephus that you were uh, quoting before. Um, the problem is that we have the necessity of adding a vowel at the end of a word if uh, that word uh, in Greek is ending with a consonant other than S. Sigma. Nu or I can say Nestor with a row at the end. This is a typical Greek name. 
I can say I can say yasson with the nu at the end. This is a typical uh, uh, this is a typical Greek name. I can have an s at the end of a word uh, like what I have here in Davides. This is typically uh, uh, Greek, but I cannot have anything else. And uh, of course, you are very familiar with that because you, you are an expert on the uh, history of the alphabet, and uh, you uh, uh, you know uh, how um, when the the Phoenician alphabet was adopted by uh, the Greeks, they had to give a name to the to the letters that would end with a vowel, because Aleph ends with an F, and you cannot say that in Greek, you have to say alpha. Uh, bet with a, with, a, with, a, with a tau, you cannot have finish and the word with a tau in Greek. You have to say beta, and so on. Because <coughs> alpha is the most uh, neutral uh, vowel. Uh, I always call the, 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 the translation of club into Japanese. In Japanese, there is the same problem. You have only... Uh, 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 sequences of consonant plus vowel, consonant plus vowel. So they cannot pronounce club. There is no cluster club, and they have to add something at the end. So they say kurabu. Kurabu is club in Japanese. So the same thing happened with uh, uh, salem. So you have two techniques. The techniques of the Septuagint, which is letters transliterated at as it is, and if people see that it is not Greek, there's no problem because in fact we are transliterating the na a name that is a, 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 a Hebrew name. Uh, and there is the other technique, the technique of uh, Flavius Josephus, which is let us try to, to make it really sound Greek. So, Salem, we have to have to add an alpha at the end, Salema. Salema, we have Solima. Let us take Solima. That sounds really Greek, and it, it fits our purposes. Um, so afterward, uh, there is, as we have Jerusalem, Solima, Jerusalema. It's really the sequence is perfectly Greek. We have the Holy Solima. <coughs> Um, yeah, just to ask, uh, yeah. Uh, perhaps there's also a phonetic uh, relationship here. The uh, the labials of the, 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 the mu uh, would be pronounced better as an u preceding it, luma instead of lema. In other words, the, because of the labial mem, you have the u that precedes it. Yeah, that's true. It's, it helps to pronounce it. However, we have also to add that uh, eta plus mem is perfectly uh, well known in Greek. We have lemma with uh, uh, you, you have uh, you have uh, many instances of eta plus mem, but perhaps of course it's easier to pronounce. So that's those are the only remarks that I would like to add uh, to this very very rich uh, lecture that you have given us. Um, just a, a small insight upon the history of the Greek name itself. <coughs>